Um, thank you very much, RCV, for inviting me um, to speak on the rural population growth policy that Urban Enterprise is working on. Uh, my name's Paul Ship. I'm a director at Urban Enterprise. You'll see our name on things like economic development strategies, tourism strategies, planning studies, housing strategies and the like. Uh, we cover uh, the fields of planning, economics and tourism fundamentally. And we've been working with RCV on uh, a rural population growth policy, which is an area that we've done quite a lot of research in uh, at, a, at a local level and also uh, at a state level in the past. So it's been a, an exciting project to be involved in. So basically, um, what I'd like to do is give you a snapshot of the evidence that we've used uh, and our draft findings. So our draft report um, is with RCV at the moment. Um, so what we're hoping to do is through collaboration with RCV um, to finalise that uh, policy report, um, which can then be used by RCV for advocacy purposes. So snapshot of the findings, where we're heading with our policy directions. Um, I work mainly with numbers and research, so apology if there's a lot of numbers being thrown at you for the next 10 minutes or so, um, but hopefully you'll be able to see everything up on the screen. A lot of it you'll already know. Um, the state population is growing very strongly. Over the last 10 years, Victoria has accommodated an additional 1.1 million residents. As you probably also know, almost all of that is going to metropolitan Melbourne. So 83% of that growth over the last 10 years has been in metropolitan Melbourne. 10% in regional centres, those are the, the 10 regional centres in Victoria, uh, and only 7% of that population growth has been in the rural areas. Uh, and I do have a map up that sort of delineates between metro, regional and rural, um, if you're not exactly clear on that, but basically rural being the RCV member councils. Um, that compares, the graph on the right hand side shows how that compares with where we were in 2006. So where we were in 2006 compared to the growth that's been taking place over the last 10 years. Um, in 2006, 73% of Victoria's population was in Melbourne. Um, but over the last 10 years, 83% of the growth is in Melbourne. In 2006, 14% of the population of Victoria was in rural areas. Over the last 10 years, only 7% of the growth has been in rural areas. So essentially what that means is that population is centralising in Victoria. It doesn't mean that all rural areas are losing population, but it means that almost all of the growth is going to metropolitan areas first, regional areas second, and rural areas third. Um, that, that's a challenge, and it's not a challenge unique to Victoria or Australia. It's a global challenge, um, but it's very evident in Victoria. Um, th there is a map there of all of the regions that we're actually using for our definitions, uh, in case I need to refer back to it. Uh, but basically it shows um, the various regions of Victoria, uh, the various councils that sit within those. And what we did for the purposes of our data analysis is to isolate peri-urban Victoria. Um, that's the orange colour you can see, so all the councils interface with metropolitan Melbourne. They're experiencing a completely different population fundamental um, to other parts of rural Victoria, and it's a, it's a critical difference um, that we see any policy around population needs to make. Um, there are very different experiences across rural Victoria in terms of population growth. Just to illustrate that point, um, these are the population growth rates over the last 10 years for each of those regions um, in percentage terms, so annual average percentage terms. Uh, you can see from the graph at the left-hand side Peri-urban Victoria experienced an average annual growth rate of 2.17 uh, over that period. That was the highest growth of any of those regions that we've created. Uh, and at the other end of the scale, uh, you can see uh, the Mallee and Wimmera Southern Mallee have experienced population decline over that period. You can see the breadth of experience is, is really quite remarkable, the difference in terms of growth rates uh, across rural Victoria. And you'll see in the middle, um, if I can get this to work. So peri-urban, on average, higher growth rate than metropolitan Melbourne. Uh, metropolitan Melbourne, the state average. Regional centres growing about 1.4% per annum, um, which is quite a strong rate of growth in terms of a historical context for regional centres. But then when you start going th through the rural councils, uh, most councils are between that sort of 0.3 to 1% to average annual growth, which is relatively um, low, but 
I suppose it's a sustainable level of growth in many cases, uh, but when you get down to uh, particularly Western Victoria, um, there are some real challenges in terms of a loss of population. So Geelong, if I can go back, uh, Geelong, Greater Geelong sits as a regional um, council, so the grey ones there, Wangaratta, Geelong, Latrobe, Horsham, Bendigo, Mildura, Warrnambool, um, they form the, the regional average at 1.4%. Uh, is this a problem? Um, this is something that governments have been uh, debating um, forever. Uh, is it a problem if some areas lose population and others uh, are growing? Um, well, a survey that we did of Rural Council Victoria members, four out of five RCV members rate the issue as very important, uh, and the other one out of five rated it as somewhat important. Uh, and three out of four councils have taken action to address population in recent years. Challenges with those actions are that there's been little limited coordination across councils, there's been some isolated attempts to attract population, uh, and very limited success was noted in terms of those initiatives. Essentially, there needs to be greater cooperation and coordination between local government and state government in terms of seeking to attract population to rural areas. The other reason that it's a problem uh, is that looking forward, Victorian future projections are for 84% of rural Victoria's growth to occur in peri-urban areas. So that's isolating it back to rural Victoria, 84% of the population growth is projected for those orange peri-urban councils. It only leaves 16% of rural Victoria's growth remaining as an option or as available um, to the other rural councils. What that means is that rural Victoria's share of the state population growth is projected, projected to continue to decline, not only to remain under what it was previously, but to continue to decline. Uh, Western Victoria, you can see at the right-hand edge of that graph, is projected to continue to decline in terms of overall population. And councils, through feedback to the survey, noted that there is a clear link between population and service provision, infrastructure provision and improvement, and most importantly, the availability of labour to support existing businesses in rural Victoria. Uh, and that's something that John, um, John Stevens will touch on immediately after my report. In terms of what the state government's currently doing, um, Jala noted uh, in her address that they're doing a range of things. Um, there's a regional jobs and infrastructure fund, a regional first homeowners grant is now available as a boost. Um, one thing I will say about that is that most of the recipients or most of the people taking up that initial boost are in peri-urban areas or in regional areas. So the boost itself hasn't actually generated uh, a noticeable impact for rural councils that aren't already growing. So essentially, um, stimulating an existing trend rather than uh, being able to address a challenge faced in other parts of rural Victoria. Um, GovHub is an initiative of the current government in terms of relocating um, state government employment um, to regional centres and we understand that that's planned to continue. Uh, and some marketing and research is being done, the Ready When You Are campaign, etc. What's missing? So missing is a population strategy or a target for rural and regional Victoria. A lot of it's happening in an ad, ad hoc way. Um, things aren't coordinated. There's no stated vision or target or strategy that the state government is working to, um, which really means that things are evolving um, very slowly and there's no commitment to a certain outcome. There's a very limited or, or really no differentiation between ru rural and regional. And that's a problem because of the graph. 1.4% in regional areas, a lot of rural areas are not growing or growing at a very low rate and that's putting pressure on service delivery. What's missing is cooperation between the local governments that are trying to attract and retain population and the state government. And what also is missing is a response to the challenges faced by Western Victoria. Western Victoria is losing population uh, across the region. And that's not an easy uh, challenge to respond to, but then in our view, there needs to be a, a targeted response to that challenge. Um, we've done a range of literature research um, over the last few years on this topic. There's all sorts of uh, research into this. Um, what comes out most clearly is that who moves 
recent migrants to an area move. Uh, so who's more likely to move than others? Recent migrants, for example, to Melbourne uh, are more likely to then move to other areas. Uh, younger people are more likely to move both in and out of an area. And regional and rural returners are more likely to move back to where they grew up in. Um, seeking to change major economic and demographic shifts, for example, uh, farmers moving off the land because of automisation or automation, uh, younger people moving to metropolitan areas for employment uh, and university and higher education. Those are major trends experienced across the world. They are very difficult to change. But regional people who grew up in regional and rural areas are far more likely to move back to rural and regional areas, uh, particularly once they're starting a family. So what we think is that there needs to be a more targeted approach to attracting population rather than simply a, a $7,000 grant um, that could go to anyone and it could go to anywhere in rural and regional Victoria. The reasons why people move are lifestyle, that's population led, so the lifestyle attracts population. Jobs, that's economy led, more jobs available in an area attracts people, that's pretty, pretty straightforward and easy to understand, and then connections. So life, uh, family connections and community connections to keep people in an area or have access to grandparents for childcare and that kind of thing. A whole range of literature research has gone into this diagram uh, and I won't talk you through it now, but I think really what it shows is the complexity of the issue. There are a whole range of reasons why people would move or stay in a community across the areas of lifestyle, um, economic environment and connections. What that says to me uh, and what the research shows is that a multifaceted policy and strategy is required. It's not enough to just have a silver bullet that says this is going to be our incentive and this is going to solve rural Victoria's population challenges. There needs to be a great degree of coordination across local government and state government. A range of population levers need to be used to attract population to areas experiencing different economic and population and demographic conditions. The last two slides I've got, um, I'm nearly done, uh, around, well, where does this take us? So what should the policy directions be for the state government in terms of attracting and retaining population in rural Victoria? And what are the actions that we're recommending? All of this is in draft form, um, so it's with RCV at the moment. Um, and really, I, I just wanted to give you a snapshot of where we're heading with the work. So. In our view, a policy needs a vision and responsibilities. State government needs to allocate or, or state what the vision actually is and who's going to be responsible for delivering the vision. And that includes a population strategy and targets. State government needs to respond to different challenges differently. Each council understands that it has unique challenges. Um, state government needs to respond to peri-urban challenges differently to um, those areas that are growing slowly completely differently to those areas that are declining in population. There needs to be the use of old and new levers. Old levers, marketing, um, small financial incentives for people to move, they're not enough. Um, new levers such as encouraging second move migration, recent migrants into Melbourne, making a second move into a rural community that has um, a skill shortage is one example of an action that we've proposed. Um, tax incentives. Um, the payroll tax discount for regional Victoria is something that we've been talking about for quite a while and it's great to see that in place. Um, that could be extended or even um, expanded to rural Victoria so that it's differentiated between metropolitan, regional and rural. Um, that's a really important incentive for businesses who can then employ more staff or reinvest in their businesses. Um, any incentive needs to target those that are more likely to move. It's not relevant to target everyone. Um, you'll never get me to move to regional and rural Victoria. I grew up in Melbourne. Um, I love visiting the regions, um, but I'm not going to move um, a, a, under my current circumstances. It's no use marketing it to me. It needs to be marketed to those who are most likely to move. Uh, leveraging lifestyle benefits, addressing skills gaps is something that John will talk about and removing barriers to movement such as planning, infrastructure, um, and there's some others that we've got in our actions as well. The last policy direction, there really needs to be better data and more consistent data around this issue across the state. Um, everyone that does research into this issue relies on secondary data such as the census, which is relatively limited, and small sample research. There really needs to be a consistent research program 
across state government that can be rolled out for all areas understanding who moves, why they move, what would have incentivised them to move or move in or move out of rural and regional areas. So the last slide is really where we ended up in terms of our uh, priorities and actions. I won't take you through all of these now. Um, the, our report has 21 actions and it covers across a whole range of areas that state and local government can influence and we believe need to form part of a coherent population attraction and retention strategy. The central piece of this puzzle, and in our view it doesn't work without it, is a state government population strategy with some targets associated to it. Um, that may include a Minister for Rural Victoria to become responsible. Uh, that's something that I'd be interested in feedback from RCV on in terms of how the governance could work. Um, increasing the existing incentives for rural areas, separate to regional areas. Uh, removing physical and regulatory barriers to growth. Establishing new incentives for those most likely to move. Uh, facilitating second move migration and having a particular part of the strategy that addresses population risk in Western Victoria. And a lot of that relates to um, opportunities around economic development and skills gaps. It's a complex issue, and hopefully the research that we've done um, can take this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. We are running a little bit of short time. Um, short uh, time limit and we do apologise for that. We do have a full agenda and we were trying to make make sure that we covered all that uh, RCV are doing but it has probably cut us a bit short of time. So again we will take a couple of questions but if you could just identify yourself and make your question very brief please. Only one thing that I believe you said wasn't correct was never say never. Uh, we might get you in the country, yeah. Um, <clears throat> everything else you said seemed to be absolutely spot on. You're, you're, um, everything that I've been thinking of and talking to other people around this room even too uh, is, is correct. Who are you speaking to? Who have, whose ears have you got with regards to all the points that you're making? Um, as, as part of this project, this is the second project that we've worked on in this space. Um, the first project was a project for Regional Development Australia um, in association with, with the Barwon South West Committee uh, and councils in that area. And although I haven't heard um, confirmation, I think that was um, an important piece of work in starting to change the way RDV thinks about um, incentivising economic development and population growth in the regions. And so things are starting to change in RDV. Um, discussions that I had with RDV um, officers uh, as part of this project were that they are seeking to continue these incentives, but the, the really compelling thing that I found was that there's not a coherent strategy. There's not something that can be implemented over time. Literature shows that a lot of population attraction measures fail a, because they haven't been measured well enough, and B, because they haven't been part of a, a coherent strategy that is stuck to by a government over a period. So I take it you're not talking to the Minister? No, so we've, um, we've been engaged by RCV, and hopefully the, this um, project enables that discussion to be had. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. Meg Edwards from South Gibson Shire Council. My question's in relation to, and I, and I recognise that one size doesn't fit all. We've, as you said, there's declining um, numbers in, in Western Victoria, but in our area of South Gippsland, it's a, almost peri-urban. Mm. Um, and there's a different issue as well. Not all growth is healthy growth, um, and I'd like to see that addressed in some of this as well. It's a little mm. bit like migration at an uh, international level. We also need to look at assimilation. We've got challenges of, I mean, growth is great, but we also need to assimilate and have respect for the foundations of a region, and I fear that some of that is getting lost in our growth. There's a lack of understanding of the core industries that come with the, with the new demographics that come into the area. They're not understanding what those risks to that, those industries are or the respect to, the, say, particularly in agriculture, there's a lack of respect for agriculture coming from the, from the new. There's a lot of great things coming in as well. Like we've got a lot of new, great new artists, food, music, all that sort of stuff, which is fantastic. 
but with that brings also a lack of understanding and it's not too much different probably to what you might see in Melbourne with a, an international migration. There is a cultural... Uh, I guess I feel like a bit like a native in Indian at the moment, I guess, and feeling like, oh, am, am I being um, disconnected from your own space and that cultural change? The assimilation also needs to be reflected in, in any growth. Growth for the sake of growth is not necessarily healthy. Yeah, I, I completely agree, and there's evidence that shows that population growth doesn't necessarily result in economic growth, and there's also evidence to show that, um, that, 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 popul that the flip side of the coin um, also is the case. Um, but what we would encourage in terms of second move migration in particular um, is that there's a range of support services provided as part of that strategy for integration within a community. Um, there's been so many great examples of um, communities that have integrated um, a migrant group um, or have been successful in uh, responding to cultural diversification, especially where that responds to a skills gap. So in our view that the skills gap really is um, should be the first priority and then um, strategies need to be put in place around that. Yeah, I think maybe my point might have been a little bit lost there. It's Sorry. not just the... It's similar to the international, but in mm. the sense of... I'm not referring to the cultural assimilation being international necessarily. It's the urban moving to country. Right. And having that, cu that cultural divide of traditionally country people with urban people and the expectations of urban services, of urban outlook on life versus a traditionally country area. Mm, yeah. Sure. Um, I suppose that's, that's something that each council probably needs to deal with differently um, in terms of how the council itself responds to, to the changes in demographics. Um, but a lot of councils have put forward very strongly to us through this project that um, population, without being able to attract population, arms and legs, um, a lot of businesses will struggle to survive and a lot of services won't be able to be provided. So I suppose getting people in first is the, is the objective and then managing, managing that growth in a sustainable way is important.